Alan Richardson is a man of firsts. He has many firsts in his life. He graduated from the first class of the law school at Georgia State University. And after serving 16 years as a county attorney in Paulding County, he was the first Republican elected from Paulding County since Reconstruction. And he went to the legislature and he was respected by his colleagues. And in 2005, he became the first Republican Speaker of the House in 130 years. And from that spot, as many of you know, he has done many good things. Uh, in this time of election, we want to thank him for making sure that we have in Georgia photo ID so we don't have voter registration fraud here in Georgia. We're not in the news. Thank you. He has also been involved in making sure we have new reservoirs. He's been involved in tax reform. And certainly from Georgia Public Policy Foundation, he has been a leader in education, especially in coordinating technical colleges and high school like our Tech High so that the children of Georgia have the very best opportunity to have the best education for their possibilities ever. We want to thank him for that. And many other people have given him many accolades and many thank yous. In 2003, he was the Georgia Legislature of the Year. In 2005, for James Magazine, he was the Man of the Year. He's the uh, Chair of the Southern um, Legislative uh, Council. And from Georgia Public Policy's point of view, he is that rarest of politicians, one who does not obfuscate. The speaker says what he means and means what he says, which is what we appreciate most of all. Please join me in welcoming Georgia Speaker of the House, Glenn Richardson. Thank you for that introduction. Um, that, uh, that philosophy of saying what you mean and mean what you say doesn't always work so well. <laughs> And uh, many of you have heard me say this at the end of my speeches, so I'll say at the beginning. I have learned many things as speaker. And uh, the truest thing I've learned, and I think the best thing I've learned in four years as speaker, is uh, what my mother used to tell me when I would get angry, Glenn, just because you think it doesn't mean you have to say it. <laughs> so I'll try to do that today. My staff always cringes when I get up here and I have prepared <laughs> remarks, and I go, I'm going to deviate from those remarks now. <laughs> and uh, their uh, heart rates get up and they say, oh my God, he's going to do it again. Uh, but I am going to deviate from my remarks here today <laughs> and start off and I'm going to tell you something that has not been told publicly. It's uh, almost a secret. And uh, all of you with the uh, Mercurial Press, I hope y'all will uh, take this down and report it widely. But uh, the number is 17. 17, and that is the number of pounds I have lost in the last two months as of today. So uh, if y'all don't mind reporting that, James, if y'all could put that and pick one of the new pictures, I mean, not one of those other ones. It's, uh, you know, that is not because I am recently single. I know some of you think that. Uh, it is because my doctor told me if I did not lose weight and get my blood pressure down that I was not going to be able to speak as speaker and say what I thought. <laughs> so I took him at his word and I have actually been exercising. I highly recommend it, except at 6 in the morning when the alarm goes off and then I don't recommend it. But uh, it's, it's, been a, um, it's been a neat four years. Um, I, I don't think I would trade it away though it has taken its toll on my life. It's been a tough four years, too. And uh, the job's not easy, but I accept it. And um, I am going to tell you what I think, and uh, I am going to lead and do what I think I'm elected to do. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If people would worry about doing the job to which they were elected instead of trying to get elected to the next job, they could do the job for which they were elected. And uh, I think that's true in a lot of politics. Too many of us worry about trying to get reelected or get the next job instead of just doing what we're supposed to do. And uh, I'm going to try to do that today. Uh, I, I don't want to not thank 
uh, Georgia Public Policy Foundation. They have been absolutely phenomenal to me and uh, the House of Representatives, Kelly and Rogers. The last year, um, even though I was headed down a path that ultimately turned out to be a little bit of a dead end, uh, they were with me all the way with data and information and uh, I am still firmly convinced that property taxes are a uh, very punitive tax and are not the best way to fund government. I still believe that consumption taxes, taxing sales as people exchange money is the best policy. And I think we'll work towards that, maybe not as quickly as I had once intended. Um, I'm here to talk to you about what's gonna come up in the next session. And I'm gonna briefly mention elections and uh, here's what I'm going to say about elections in the House. I, I don't keep up with anything else too much. But uh, the Georgia House of Representatives, the Republican caucus, will, after November 4th, have a solid majority still in the Georgia House of Representatives, a solid Republican majority. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. I won't talk about individual races, although there's not a single race in Georgia that I do not know every single number on, and I keep up with that. I wake at night thinking about those because uh, I think that's part of my job is to make sure Republicans get elected. It also makes it easier for me to be speaker. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that. To those members of the Republican caucus here today, I did see several House members and I don't want to lose this opportunity. Uh, there's only a few people in this room that can vote for me and that's those House members. And would y'all do the honor of standing up, and I won't call your names, but would you just stand for a minute and let me thank you for voting for me last year. And again, this, I'll take that, uh, I'll take that as, uh, uh, as a show of a uh, yes. So I'll put you in that column. Thank you. Um, the, uh, this economic situation, I don't have to say this. Everybody knows the volatility is, uh, is really quite disturbing. None of us ever has ever seen anything like this. But I spoke earlier this week. And I, I keep hearing people on the national scene and one particular person that wants to be president saying this is the worst economic situation since the Great Depression. And it occurs to me that he wasn't born until about 50 years after the Great Depression. And he didn't live through the Great Depression, but my grandparents did. And I think while times are tough and the economy is unpredictable, in the Great Depression, People didn't sit and eat meals like we did. Very good job on the meal today. I skipped the banana pudding. But my grandparents and your grandparents were worried about how they were going to eat that day. They weren't worried about eating tomorrow. They were worried about how they were going to eat and feed their family that day. And while we're concerned about whether it's our 401k or just our 401, and while we've lost value, we're not worried about how we're going to eat. And we're going to be able to eat and we're gonna survive this and we're gonna sustain it and we're gonna come back because we really are the greatest country in the world at the greatest time in the world and our system works. And uh, it'll be back, this is not the Great Depression. It may be after the election if the wrong person gets elected with their tax policy, but nonetheless, we're gonna make it. Now, down economic times are gonna occur and only a fool doesn't think there's going to be down times. Uh, that's how you know when there's up times. The down economic times are translating to the state level. And uh, the state is being forced to make some really difficult choices. I'll talk to you briefly about what's happening, but the budget is going to dominate the General Assembly. There's no doubt about it. Because when the economy goes down and state revenues goes, goes down, we're forced to make decisions. And those decisions really come down to two. You either raise more revenue by raising taxes, or you tighten your belt and cut services. Make no mistake about it, as long as I'm Speaker and the Georgia House of Representatives under the Constitution of this state has the authority to originate all bills involving revenue, I, I do not intend to raise the taxes on the people of the state of Georgia. We're going to, there'll be painful, it will hurt, there'll be criticisms, but when people are having down economic times, the state has to do what they have to do, and we're going to do it again. We've had 
three out of six years that have been very tough. And uh, we're going to do it again, and we're going to make the cuts. Uh, so the budget will dominate this session. Uh, the first two months of this fiscal year, I think everybody knows it was, uh, we were, they followed the last two months of the previous fiscal year where our revenue had been uh, greatly down. And uh, there was a lot of questions and people saying, should we have a special session? Should we meet to talk about this? And we were talking with the governor and lieutenant governor, and yes, we talk and yes, we work together. And have done so through this crisis and um, I was of the opinion that we didn't need to do that right now we needed a longer picture and uh, it was we didn't need to rush to judgment we needed to prepare for the worst but not start making decisions and lo and behold September numbers came in and they were up now then I don't know if that continues in October November and December I really don't know maybe not but at least as of today the numbers for the state are not nearly as far down as they were in July or August. Uh, they're down 2.6%. Now, down 2.6% by definition means we're below zero 2.6 and we had projected a growth. So we are, if we continue this pattern, headed for somewhere in the, the high 1.5, $1.6 billion range under what we thought. And we'll have to make those cuts. And that will dominate the early days of this session as we get through those. And uh, we'll make the votes, and uh, I'll stand by those decisions. The um, good part about the budget is this governor, Governor Sonny Perdue, came into office when he was elected in 02. I still remember the very first meeting I had as, as the first floor leader in the House for a Republican governor. I was thinking about that just a minute ago. I've had a lot of opportunities. And, uh, you know, that's how you can mess those up when you're the first. But uh, the very first meeting as a floor leader, I walked into the meeting in December of 02. I was so excited. We had a Republican governor, the Senate had gone Republican, and uh, the House had not quite made it yet. And I walked into the meeting, and uh, I was uh, fat, dumb, and happy. I said, boy, we got this. We're now in charge. And they said, well, we got some good news and bad news. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? There's good news and bad news. I thought we were getting ready for an inauguration at a party. And they said, well, uh, the bad news is that uh, it appears clear that the Barnes administration has played a game with the numbers and extended it over the last few months. They would close the month on the 2nd this month, the 4th the next month, the 6th the next month, the 12th the next month. And they've been rolling this deficit forward, and we're broke. And I went, we're broke? How, how can we be broke? Well, they said, we're worse than broke. We're about to be in the hole. And if we, we've got to come in and adjust numbers now and come into the very first session as a Republican governor, and we've got to cut the budget. And I said, wow, that's the bad news. What's the good news? They said, well, we've got a way to do it. It is a tax increase on cigarettes and alcohol. And I went, oh, okay, well, that's good news. Thanks a lot. I still remember presenting that to the Republican caucus the first time, and uh, which uh, is an interesting ordeal in and of itself. Think about that meeting. But we uh, made it through there. And this governor, we took what we thought was a reserve fund down to $50 million. And then over the course of his first term and up to now, we built the reserves up to about $1.5 to $1.6 billion, so much so that last session the Democratic leaders were screaming, oh, you're hoarding too much money, you got too much. We ought to spend it on education, spend it on fill in the blank. Wherever we could spend it, just spend it. Uh, that is the mentality sometimes. We resisted, though we spent some money, and we finished this fiscal year. If we had not had that money, we would have been in trouble. We finished uh, between five and six hundred million in the hole and had to dip into that reserve and may have to do it again. But if, um, if I don't, you don't hear anything else. I applaud the governor for doing that. He, uh, he forced us to save money, and uh, thank goodness for his vision and foresight. We would be in a much uh, difficult place than we are today, and we're in a better place than a lot of other states because of fiscal restraint. And uh, we need to show a little more fiscal restraint coming up this next year. But that's the budget. That's the good news. Um, <laughs> bad news is is you have to listen to me for about 10 or 15 more minutes 
uh, unless you need to excuse yourself. We, uh, one of the things that I heard in this last four years as been speaker is uh, from my own members is that sometimes that we had a top down, that perhaps we got out in front on issues and didn't bring along the members and let them have input. And uh, I don't know if that was correct or not, but I listened to it and I said, okay, we'll change how we do that. And uh, so this summer, I said, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to form a committee. I'm going to call it the Policy Committee. And I'm going to pick eight or ten of you from all over the state, from various riches, and I'm going to ask you if you would kindly serve on this committee and help us develop policy initiatives. So I picked several members of the Republican Caucus, put them on the Policy Committee. I asked them to send a letter to every member of the caucus and ask them to exhaustively set forth all the issues that they wanted to address in the 2009 session. Um, a large number of members participated in that. That policy committee then took those issues, synopsized them, came to our caucus retreat uh, this summer, presented them, asked every member of the Republican caucus to prioritize those with what position they thought they should be. Everyone voted. That policy committee met again, synopsized those, came up with a list of the four top things that we should do in the 2009 session, and I think you'll find it miraculous. They're the issues we've been talking about in the past because we believe this is what the people of Georgia want. And so we have four matters that we're going to take up early in the 2009 session. We'll have bills introduced um, as soon as we get started, and the first one is going to deal with taxes. Uh, the Republican... House is going to bring forth a proposed bill, much like we did in the past on taxes, that will freeze the rate of assessment increases of property in Georgia at not more than the rate of inflation or 3%, whichever is less. We're going to stop property values from going up, up, up and having backdoor tax increases. We keep trying this and trying this and we've not been successful. And we're gonna propose a constitutional amendment to cap that rate on the rate of growth. Uh, I tell this anecdotally, during uh, 2000, when I started this proposal about taxes, in the 2006, total gross revenues from all property taxes in Georgia was $8.2 billion. During the debate over whether property taxes were rising too greatly, they rose to $9.7 billion in 07. A $1.5 billion increase in actual revenue generated from all property taxes, or 20%. Our economy didn't grow by 20%. Then, during this session when we talk about it, the 2008 numbers came in after the debate had ended, and property tax revenues grew another billion dollars just this year, or 10%, a little over 10%. So, I think the answer is clear. The rate of property taxes people are paying is growing at a rate greater than the rate of inflation, and greater than the ability of property owners to pay, and we're going to slow that down this next session in the first part of the 09 session. We're going to give it to Georgia voters and see if they want to do that. The next issue that we're going to take up, and yes, they're T's, and no, it's not my acronym, Taxes, Transportation, Trauma, and Teaching. Transportation, uh, as you know, the, the House, uh, in a bipartisan effort, adopted a proposed statewide transportation funding formula to allow a vote and to have an uh, extra tax to uh, fund transportation. Now, I'm going to digress just a minute because that very vote was one that I voted for, or I stood and spoke for, and the Republican House leadership voted for, and the Democratic House leadership voted for. Just this week, the Democratic Party of Georgia put out a piece of mail on a certain representative in Rome that said she voted for a tax increase. And I thought to myself, well, so did the minority leader and the entire virtual, entire Democratic caucus with the message that if you elect this Democrat, he won't vote for this when all the Democrats did vote for it. I, I think people are tired of that style of politics, and it's a tad ironic. Only the Friday before, the state Republican Party called me and said, there's a piece of mail that we're looking at that people want to send out. It attacks a Democratic representative for voting for the transportation plan and says she voted to increase taxes. 
what do you think? And I said, absolutely not. I will not allow anything that I have control over or can veto a piece of mail that criticizes someone for voting something that me and leadership stood for. I challenge Representative Porter and the Democrats to do the same. It is not just deceitful, it's hypocrisy. It needs to end. People are tired of that style of politics. I think they get it. Back to transportation. The plan that we had was not my favorite. It really wasn't. It was not what I wanted. I, I, I thought the best transportation solution was a statewide plan with statewide funding. I think transportation is not just an Atlanta issue, it's a statewide issue, and we have to look at it across the state. I'm pleased to say that Georgia Public Policy Foundation briefed me today. They're looking into this, thank goodness, with a different and fresh look and have some ideas that will be on the table, I hope, in January. But here's what the Republican caucus commits to do, is in January we'll come forward with a proposal for a transportation solution to Georgia's transportation problems. It may be similar to the one we proposed previously that did not pass the Senate, but it will be a proposal of some sort to put on the ballot a question for Georgians to decide if that's the manner they want to solve transportation. The, uh, the next issue is trauma. Uh, we, uh, we, we came to a disagreement over trauma funding in this state. In a down economic times, I guess it's not good to talk about new funding. But uh, we've got to answer the question about what to do about trauma funding. Uh, we took that up in the House. As you know, we, we took the tax off autos and placed a $10 fee on for trauma care. And uh, that measure was promptly addressed in the Senate uh, on the 41st day and uh, did not succeed. <laughs> the, uh, the, the solution was good because it took one tax off and put a fee on, and I, I think that's consistent a policy. But at this point, it's clear that we have got to come up with either a method of funding it through the general budget or a designated source of revenue for trauma care. We are going to work diligently with Senate leaders and the governor to come up with a formula that works to designate funds so that we have a statewide funding trauma network, and we'll do that in the early days of January of 2009 as the session begins. The last category that, that the, uh, came out of that policy committee was uh, teaching, education. You know, it amazes me that, it, that education still seems to be the elephant in the room that we ignore. Uh, I believe that virtually every problem we have we could solve by increasing our educational efforts and it's not about more money it's not about more money it's about a lot of things and it's changing a philosophy about how we educate Georgia high school students now are we doing better today than we were a couple of years ago yes we are but Georgia's high school graduation rates are still abysmal they're still somewhere in the 60s or maybe 70 percent it doesn't matter if it's 64 68 or 71 any way you state that if it's 70%, that means three out of every 10 of Georgia's high school students are not graduating from high school. That is unacceptable. It is a sad story that we all shirk away from. And here's the worst part about it, is that it's having a disproportionate effect on the minority community because well more than the percentage of minorities in this state are not graduating from high school and we keep looking the other way. Georgia Public Policy Foundation has worked on that at uh, Atlanta Tech, and uh, they're doing a great job there. I went out there last year. And it's amazing when you give kids an option what they'll do. They really do want to learn, but they don't want to be discouraged either. One of the things I believe we've got to do, and we had a bill that Representative Fran Millar handled because he'd been looking at this issue for quite some time, is that Maybe we're missing the boat and trying to educate everybody to go to college. Uh, a statistic I throw out that's a very disturbing one, but it's a, it's a truthful statistic, is of all Georgia's high school students, those that were, will ever get a four-year degree is only about 14%. 
By definition, that means 86% of our students aren't actually going to and graduating from college. And if that's true, why does everybody have to take college algebra, college English, college history, or college whatever? Now, don't mistake what I'm saying. I want every kid to go to college. Wouldn't that be wonderful? They went to college and graduated. But they're not going to. It's not going to happen. But they do have to get a job. They do have to learn a skill. And they do have to be able to produce part of this Georgia economy. The way you do that is the way that Representative Fran Millar and I proposed as a second sign on that bill was what we called the Bridge Bill. The Bridge Bill said that we're going to have parallel courses of Georgia high school students, much like we have in the career academies. The only problem with the career academies is there's not enough of them. What we said is every high school in the state of Georgia will, by a time certain date, offer a parallel course. And you can come in and you can take classes at the local technical and adult education college and you'll get high school credit for those. And when you graduate from high school, you'll also have a certificate, whether it's welding or information technology, medical, radiology, what, whatever, whatever. There's 50 fields that DTAE, and I know they've changed their name. I still call them DTAE. It's hard to change that, but technical and adult colleges offer. And during the day, they sit there vacant while we have high school students that are sitting in high school classes that don't want to be there, that are not challenged, and we could be teaching them a skill. And it's time we do that. And the Georgia Republican House Caucus commits that in 09, we will bring that to the floor for a vote, and we will change how we are educating Georgia's high school students. It's time we do it. Every day that passes that we do nothing, someone else fails and doesn't graduate from high school. And I believe that is the most pressing issue we face above everything else. Well, it has been a, uh, an interesting four years. Um, if um, I can convince 90 of my closest friends, actually about 84 now, given your commitments here today, <laughs> to, uh, to vote for me on November the 10th, six days following the election, uh, I'll, I'll be speaker for two more years, and I look forward to doing that. And during that time, I'll commit to you to do the same thing I said earlier. And uh, that is, uh, I will not say everything I think, but I will mean what I say and go forward and give you my word. If you ask me where I stand on the issue, I'll tell you. You may not like the answer, and that's okay, too. You didn't elect me or any of the representatives to agree with you, only to listen to you and listen to options on how to solve problems for the state. We're going to do that. We're going to get through these times. And this time, a year or two from now, we'll say, you remember how bad 2008 was? Boy, isn't it good to be back in good times. Thank you for your time, and thank you for letting me be here today.